I'd like to welcome you to the Barbara Mand Hansen Lecture Series for 2012. This is a wonderful turnout. Um, really, just so impressed to see all of you here. Did everybody be able to find a seat? There's a few chairs over here if you're sitting on someone's lap. Okay, all right. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. I just wanted to tell you um, before we do, since we've got such a great turnout of students here, there are sign-up sheets right outside the door if you um, miss that and you want to get extra credit for class, be sure to go over there and sign your name. We'll be returning those sheets to um, different faculty that teach different courses, so you want to make sure you get your name on there. Um, other kinds of things, some of you may be um, early childhood professionals that are needing training credit, um, a certificate for that, and we also have a sign-up sheet on the table out there also for that, so be sure that you get your name on that too as well. Okay and more people are coming in. So everybody point, I see a few chairs that way, point that way when they walk in the door. Okay. Well, as I said, this is the Barbara Mand Hansen Lecture Series. And we have this series every year. We invite a lecturer into the college and into our department specifically to talk with students and faculty and staff about important current topics. And we have two goals for that. One is to learn from their expertise. The other goal is to engage us and, and help us um, become engaged in very um, interesting conversations with each other. We, we talk a lot. We bounce ideas off each other. We learn what's happening in other states. And it sparks new ideas. And we've had many um, successful projects actually come out um, or, or began because of uh, the, the, the this discussion that we've had with the Hanson Project. So uh, we're very, very fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to do this. Our Hanson Lecture for 2012 is Dr. Laura Bellows from Colorado State University. And Dr. Bellows is nationally recognized as an expert um, and for her work in prevention of, of childhood obesity and specifically in the areas of nutrition and physical activity in early childhood programs. She's been with us the last few days um, discussing different ideas and sharing some of the work that she's done. Um, she's had a wonderful program in Colorado that's gotten a lot of national attention. It's reached 60,000 children. That's, that's pretty impressive. And she's very focused, especially not just on nutrition, but getting children active, because that's a big part of the equation. Often when we talk about childhood obesity, the entire focus is, well, much of the focus is on nutrition. And she's been able to bring the physical activity aspects of it to our attention. And we've had a lot of discussion about that. So I think we... <laughs> I think you will really enjoy what she has to share with you. We've learned a lot from her already over the last few days. And I'd like to invite you um, to help me welcome Dr. Laura Bellows. Thank you. And it's, it's a privilege to be here tonight um, to talk with you about what we are doing in early childhood uh, around both nutrition and physical activity. But I do want to thank Dr. Hong and, and Lisa as well as the planning committee for inviting me. Um, it's been a wonderful two days. I will say it is my first real trip to Iowa. Um, I've driven the I-80 quarter back to Michigan for Christmases, so I'm actually pleased to, to see Iowa and Ames as a great community. So what I'm going to, once I get acquainted here, um, talk to you a little bit about is just set the stage of obesity in preschool because a lot of times we hear why little kids what's going on the little kids are active enough and why is there an obesity problem in preschoolers and what is that problem what are the nutrition and physical activity behaviors that are contributing um, to that talk a little bit about the efforts that we've done in Colorado that have um, as Lisa said have reached quite a few kids not just in Colorado but we have expanded it to several other states and then the future direction of where we're going to look at some of the factors around childhood obesity, um, where the research should go, where practitioners might want to think, and where communities, schools, and families can really start to address uh, these behaviors and issues in their own environments um, as well. 
and hopefully I will not talk too long and leave some time um, for some questions and dialogue um, for, for you to, to spark some interest there. So again, why focus on preschoolers? Uh, I've mentioned to several folks that I've met with over the last couple of days, uh, this is an area I've been working in for 12 years, and obesity, when, we, when I first started, we were writing grants around literacy. How do we tie nutrition to literacy? Obesity wasn't even on the radar um, as short a time as, as 10 years ago. Um, but what we do know is that obesity rates have tripled in preschoolers over the last 30 years. Um, currently, one out of three children between the ages of two and five is considered either overweight or obese. Um, it is, um, you can see here the trend, uh, the solid line is all kids. This is a national population of 2.2 million children in that age category of two to five years of age with different minorities being higher and lower, Hispanics as well as um, American Indians have the highest prevalence. So we know that it's increasing. Um, we are seeing it at much younger ages. The reason we have data on two to five year olds is primarily because of our WIC data, um, where we're capturing that with limited resource families. We don't have a great data, database for families that are of higher income, um, but we are seeing a, a much larger prevalence in the minority as well as the low income uh, families. What we also know from research is that anywhere between 26 and 41 percent of obese adults were overweight as children, as young as in their preschool years. So we see working in preschool as a really um, opportune window in, in t of time to, to address this so that we can build healthy habits early so that they do not become obese children and then obese adults. Obese children as you, many of you probably already know, have short-term health problems, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, increased rates of depression. Um, and what we're seeing, which, which to me is something that probably needs to get addressed a little bit more, is the social and emotional difficulties that come along with childhood obesity. We have seen that in children as young as six, um, they describe their overweight peers as lazy, cheaters, ugly, some very harsh and negative um, adjectives that are being described for that. So we know that obese children are going to have a more difficult time um, in, in their childhood years because of that emotional and social difficulties. So when we look at childhood obesity, we're looking at it from an ecological perspective. Um, there are not, it's not one factor or two factors that are going to contribute to the solution or that are contributing to the problem. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at it in the center, you'll see the child characteristics, which is the dietary intake piece, physical activity piece, as well as um, sedentary behavior. Um, in the next sphere is looking at parenting. What is going on in the home environment? And a lot of things about child feeding, role modeling, um, family time together, family activity time together, those physical activity patterns of both the parent um, and siblings, TV time and screen time, and the d dietary patterns of the family all will contribute to the child. And then in the community at large, looking at accessibility, um, affordability of foods, accessibility to safe uh, physical activity environments. Uh, as well as the social, the school systems and what's going on in, in the child care centers as well. So there is a plethora of places to intervene and the question becomes where's the best place to intervene, the most impactful place to intervene, what's the right combination to intervene and those are questions that the, the field of obesity prevention are really starting to look at is how do we do this out in the real world because this is very messy research. Um, Going out into communities, everyone has, every community has different contexts and schools are doing it. You probably cannot find um, a school district or child care center that's not doing something around healthy eating and physical activity because of the emphasis on childhood obesity. So what's going on from a behavioral perspective um, with these kids? From a dietary intake perspective, what we do know is that as kids age, their diet gets worse. 
Um, your best diet years, as far as the nutritional status, tend to be when you're young, very young, infant and into toddlerhood. Um, according to USDA and the Healthy Eating Index, 36% of two to three-year-olds had what we would deem a good diet. And that uh, was cut in half when they, went to, when they became four to six years of age. And once you get into the adolescent years, it's just a dismal number. So we know that we have, we have a window here to work with. From a physical activity perspective, and this is actually a relatively new area, there's always an assumption that little kids are active enough. So there wasn't a whole lot of research uh, around measuring um, the actual amount of activity that kids are getting, but what we do know is anywhere, depending on the study, that 8 to 33% are meeting physical activity recommendations, which is um, 60 minutes of structured physical activity a day up to several hours of unstructured physical activity. So think structured as your PE or teacher-led, adult-led, and unstructured as recess, outdoor time, and running around. Of that time, which is not a lot for the minutes, what we're finding is that kids are not engaged in moderate to vigorous physical activity. So they might be active, but it's light activity and not um, an intense enough activity to have health benefits. So when we're looking at nutrition from a behavioral perspective and a developmental perspective, um, we do know that your preference for foods, which is your likes and dislikes, are, they determine your food choice and your food intake. What we also know is that early food choices are very predictive of your adult food choices. We actually form your eating habits in the first six years of life. But what's going on in your first six years of life is something called food neophobia. And it's a fear of trying new fo foods. Um, Neo being new, phobia, anything um, fearful of. In, in this case, it's about food. And that shows up about uh, 24 months and can go up to six uh, years of age. And kids naturally will reject anything that is, that is new. And the more they reject, the less they're willing to, to try. It has a great impact on their food choices. So it does take 8 to 12 offerings of a new food before a child is familiar enough with it that they're willing to put it in their mouth and, and swallow it. Um, by exposing kids to new foods, they're going to become familiar with it. And exposing does not need, mean to be, it has to be on a plate, and it has to be something that they can eat. But there are other ways that you can expose kids to food through um, just having them look at an avocado, feel the texture of an avocado, read a book about an avocado, things that can be incorporated into um, the early childhood setting, that helps build the familiarity so that they are willing to put it in their mouth and swallow it. And then it's up to the child to decide whether or not they have a preference for it. Um, and then if they do have a positive preference or liking for it, that will dictate their intake. And so, we trying to get kids to have the exposure to a variety of foods and not just fruits and vegetables. There's such a push on fruits and vegetables. Most kids will try fruit. It's sweet, it's a natural flavor that we as human beings really enjoy. Um, but we're trying to expose them to a wide variety of foods so that we can enhance their, their dietary intake and potentially have um, that can be carried on into child, later childhood and into adulthood. One of the, the things that we have noticed, and I'll show you a slide a little later, is that the exposure kids are going to what some refer to as playing with foods. I like to say it's exploring with food. It is the touching, the smelling, the licking, the putting in their mouth and spitting it back out, which can be not pleasant etiquette, but the more you spend time with three, four, or five-year-olds, there's not the etiquette is something they learn. Um, but that's becoming familiar with it as well. So giving them the, the okay to explore their food um, and build that familiarity will have a, a great impact on whether or not they choose to put the food in their mouth and swallow it. Setting structured meal times is another big piece around nutrition with this age group. Um, they have a tremendous ability as a young child to self-regulate, meaning they know when they are hungry and when they are full. As they get into school age, because of the times that the, the schedule allows lunch, I'm sure some of you have either had kids or have seen kids where they're eating lunch at 10 in the morning. They're not eating when they're hungry, they're eating when they're told that is their opportunity to eat. So in early childhood, there's a little more um, 
flexibility with it that they are eating when they're hungry and kids can then decide whether or not they're going to eat based on hunger not based on um, it being present and if they know that they're not hungry at this time they know they're going to get something else in two hours so having some regularly scheduled times to eat is very critical in this age group so that they have um, the independence to say I'm not going to eat this food when it comes to physical activity, um, this the first bullet shouldn't surprise anyone um, that low levels of activity are associated with obesity, with uh, greater, higher BMI, greater fat mass, and obese status. That shouldn't be a shocker. It's also um, activity can prevent um, accelerated weight gain, and so we can stop the increase in. in um, the trajectory of, of, of the BMI going upwards. And with this age group, what we're, we're looking at and what the research is saying is that, that motor skills have a link with physical activity. Motor development is, is critical in this early childhood phase. Children with poor motor development are awkward, uncoordinated, and have less confidence um, in the way they move than kids who have greater proficiency. And if you think back to your own PE days, who were the kids standing on the sidelines? Or who were the kids who were reluctant to participate tended to be the, the children who were not comfortable in how they moved. Um, so we're looking at the work we're doing is trying to get kids to be comfortable with the way their body moves and proficient in their motor ability so that they'll enjoy activity and want to carry activity um, and lead an active life um, throughout childhood as well as into adulthood. Um, children with poor motor performance are less active. They, they also ha are, spend less time in moderate to vigorous physical activity. But, and I'll talk a little bit on the next slide about what motor skills we're talking about, but locomotor skills being your walking, running, galloping, those large movements that'll get you from point A to point B. Kids who have higher levels of locomotor skill do spend significantly more time in more vigorous physical activity and less time in sedentary behaviors. Um, so there's a lot of, and there is a gender difference, um, but think about your very active little boys. Um, those are the kids who are very proficient in their motor skills or locomotor skills um, and are getting that activity. What we don't know is what comes first, and I don't think one comes first, but they work synergistically, is are they more active because they have better skills or do they have better skills because they're more active? Um, but locomotor skills in particular probably play a very critical role in establishing physical activity levels as well as confidence in physical activity levels in this age group. So what are motor skills? Because you, you hear that term quite a bit in, in development um, literature. Uh, there's the fine motor skills, but what I'm talking about is really that gross large muscle um, motor development and those are the building blocks for movement and we generally break that down into the three types which is your locomotor uh, the non locomotor stability which is balancing bilateral coordination um, ever get a, a four-year-old to try to do this task is it's it's comical because they're like hitting themselves um, and that's something that needs to be developed um, as as time goes in, in early childhood manipulative the throwing, catching, striking a ball, um, anything with, with an object like that. And then when we're looking at development of, of movement, we're looking at the skill. And I describe the skill as a noun. Um, and then what we're adding to it is a concept. So your noun is walking. And then what we're going to add to it is walk fast, walk slow, um, walk under the table, um, walk around the table. So you start using adjectives as a concept and start working on the movement patterns and the vocabulary of how your body can move in different spaces. Then we, we add that and we add patterns. Um, and patterns don't typically develop until about age six. And that's um, sport skills lead to patterns. So when I always hear of little kids, like three, four-year-olds who are in soccer, um, the feasibility of a young child being able to run and kick a ball with opposition 
um, is they're not developmentally there quite yet. But certainly there are skills and concepts we can teach them to lead to patterns that will lead to sports skill with that. So there's a lot that um, in the activity piece that we need to build on. Um, and really where we're lacking in this, this field when it comes to providers and teachers is training on, on the physical activity piece of it. So we get a lot of the nutrition piece um, coming from our, our public health programs and extension and so forth. So this has been kind of the void around obesity prevention um, is how do we, how do we enhance the, the early childhood educators and give them the confidence um, to teach gross motor development um, in the classroom or home. So putting this together from a prevention recommendation um, from the nutrition side of things, providing early experiences with food and flavor is critical um, to get those kids exposed to a wide range of foods to help them get over the food neophobia, um, developing healthy food preferences and being respectful. Not everyone likes every food they've ever tried. And so it is okay if a little kid tries a food and they don't like it. We as adults need to praise them for trying it and then move on. Exposing children to age and developmentally appropriate physical activity. Um, and that I think is, is an emerging um, piece of this equation is making sure that it is developmental, developmentally appropriate. It is very difficult in a classroom where you have three, two, five-year-olds. The, the ability level from a motor perspective is very large from what a three-year-old can do and a five-year-old. So when you have a mix of children of different abilities, how do you have a, a activity or a lesson that can truly accommodate all the kids by um, being inclusive, but not so easy that the kids or the five-year-olds and have better skills are bored to death and, and need some engagement there. Prevention early adiposity rebound. And, and what happens in early childhood is we lose our baby fat and then we rebound and put that fat back on. And the literature will say that the earlier that you rebound, the, it's a higher risk for obesity in later childhood. So making sure that we can address that early adiposity rebound is, is critical. Um, and again, from that ecological perspective, looking at not just reaching the children, but providing nutrition and physical activity education to parents, teachers, and providers as well. I always talk to um, the students that I work with, they're very eager to get to the child of how are we going to do this with the children. And I said, well, wait a minute, there's a couple of audiences before you get to the kids that we really need to address. You're never going to get to the kids if you don't have something that the parents want or if you don't have something the teachers agree with or really want to do um, or the extension agents. So we need to make sure that they're a part of how we're developing something so that the end user the child is actually going to get something um, that is effective. So I want to just now, now that I've given that little bit of background, that really provides um, the rationale for the work that, that we're doing in Colorado. Um, like I said, I've been doing work with early childhood for about 12 years, and it started with a program called Food Friends, um, Fun with New Foods. Very focused on picky eating, um, getting kids to try a variety of foods. And then, I think it was about 2005, right when we started to hear about obesity and early childhood and there were some funding opportunities, we said, well, we're pretty well positioned because we have this nutrition program and so let's um, see if we can get some funding to add a physical activity component to it. So we... Um, Exhaustively, I spend a lot of time in Head Start centers, um, child care centers, talking with parents. Um, Mighty Moves was actually my doctoral dissertation, so my friends at the time all had preschoolers. And so as my husband's at a barbecue, hanging out, having a burger, drinking a beer, I'm upstairs with the little kids being dressed up like a cat, being told I need to play meow and do this, and trying to get into their heads what motivates three-year-olds. Um, what are they interested in? What's the language? I watched more Dora the Explorer and those kinds of cartoons on demand 
um, things because I really believe in order to be an effective educator, you need to understand the people you're trying to affect. Um, so we have spent an, a lot of time um, doing focus groups, interviewing, just having conversations um, with our audiences. We put this into a social marketing framework. And the one thing I'll just say about this is understanding your, your target audience, but understanding what makes them tick and what is the cost benefit of asking them to do what you're wanting them to do. So for physical activity, what's the cost to a teacher to ask her to do 15 to 20 minutes of physical activity a day in the classroom? It was space, it was time, it was competition with other academic um, curriculum. Um, so we had to accommodate that cost. Looking at it from a behavioral perspective, um, we wanted a behavioral theory that we incorporated. And we, both of our programs have a classroom piece, a teacher training component, as well as a home connection. In Colorado, we have about 50% of our Head Start families are Spanish speakers, so we, it was bilingual as well, so we had to incorporate the cultural differences there. So these are the food friends. Uh, quick introduction, it's Ollie Orange, Tina Tortilla, Bella Bean, Gertie Gouda, Corinne Carrot, Marty Milk, Rudy D. Radish, and Howie Hamburger. Um, and these characters actually got a makeover with their superhero. Um, they're super tasters now. Um, and that came after we did the Mighty Moves program, but very narrowly focused on a single behavior to get kids over their picky eating and increase their willingness to try new foods. It is a 12-week program, and it is 12 weeks because it takes 8 to 12 exposures to a new food before a child will want to try it. Um, they do it a couple times a week over those 12 weeks. You can see in the bottom um, right corner is a picture. Teachers are provided with a kit. Um, we've been told, just give us everything we need so we don't have to do any preparation. They get puppets, puzzles, um, a sorting game, storybooks, posters, flashcards, everything to kind of bring these characters to life. We know that kids can't read, so everything is very pictorial at this age, and they want fun. Everything has to exude fun. Um, they all have personalities. They role play them. Um, I've gone and sat and eaten where they tell me that they're eating torn Tina Tortilla with Ollie Orange and drinking Marty Milk and they're going to have Bella Bean and they're not into cannibalism yet at this age. They haven't figured that out, which is a good thing. Um, we are kind of working with first graders who are starting to question it a bit, but um, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So. In our, our original study, um, we actually had observers in the classroom tracking what children did when we introduced the daikon radish, which Rudy D. Radish it was one of our indicator foods. And we were really interested in what the evolution of trying a food was going to be. Um, so the purple bars in the back are actually swallowing. How many of the kids swallowed the food? And then how many did this, these exploratory behaviors, smelling, playing, spitting, and swallowing? So in week one, we had almost 70% of the kids try to die on radish. And you might say, well, then what's the point? Why, why, you just told me kids don't try new foods. It takes eight exposures. What this is is what we call the novelty effect. They just got introduced to the, the puppets. There's someone new in their classroom. Sure, I'll try it. Um, and then half of the kids kind of got a little smart in week two, and only, I think it's about 42% of the kids tried it. And then by week three, just over 30% of the kids tried it, which is our true baseline of kids being willing to try a new food. And you can see then that the, the consumption went up and peaked in week eight, where we had just about 80% of our, the kids were trying the daikon radish. I think after that, they probably just got sick of it, and it, it weaned a little bit. But... I want to show, draw your attention to the bars in front because those exploratory behaviors all went down over time. And so as consumption went up, the exploratory behaviors went down. And so what we drew from this is that those exploratory behaviors are building the familiarity. And we've built this into our teacher trainings that it's imperative that you, you talk to kids about if they're not willing to taste it. Well, then touch it and smell it and use your senses so that you become familiar enough with it that you're willing to put it in your mouth and swallow it. Um, 
So we had um, some good success with getting the kids with the program to do that. So we then did get a USDA grant um, to add this physical activity program, which looked at, at providing physical activity opportunities in the classroom, but also we were interested in can we enhance gross motor performance. And um, one of my colleagues in occupational therapy said, I'm not sure we really can do it over the time frame we're gonna do it. And we were very pleased with the, the data on the back end. It's 18 weeks in length, um, no rationale other than that. We had a school year and we had needed enough time to do our, our testing assessments in the, on the front end and the back end. Teachers in our, our early formative work said they wanted it for four days out of the week, four days being a Head Start week because they have Fridays off um, for 15 to 20 minutes a day. They wanted it packaged just like Food Friends in a kit, here it is. Um, so you can see that they do get these activity mats, which are awesome because they keep kids from poking each other and teachers love them because sm small space was a very big concern. Um, they come in different colors with a different character, so we build the activities around that. So they might stand on Marty milk, on, they have to balance so they don't spill their milk that day, or there's a lot of things built that. There's bean bags, balls, um, they do a caping ceremony halfway through where the kids get their superpowers so they get a cape. Um, there's lots of things for the, the teachers in there. Um, very much focused on those three motor skills that we talked about as well as adding concepts and patterns to it. And we did scaffold the, the curriculum so that the three-year-olds um, could build their skills and then build on the four-year-olds and the five-year-olds with that. Superhero theme, extremely popular. Um, Mighty Moves are actually their gross motor skills that we build, and all the food friends live in the town of Hill, Philadelphia, where um, they go on imaginary journeys. We created a custom musical CD, so um, the characters take the kids all throughout um, Hill, Philadelphia. To give you an example, um, Howie Hamburger loves his tricycle. He also loves the playground, so he actually in his journeys, he helps um, the park ranger um, clean the park up and help other kids show them what to do to be physically active. And his superpower is transforming himself. So he can use his lettuce as a parachute, his tomato as a surfboard, and he can paddle on his bun across Lake Health Adelphia. Um, and the kids will act out these behavior or these these um, activities and so forth. So. What we found from this program is we went out and did um, what's called the Peabody Developmental Motor Scales. And we spent about 30 minutes with each child at pre and, and post intervention and came up with a composite score of all three um, locomotor skill sets. And we're quite fascinated by this outcome. We expected our control group to increase in motor performance because of maturity. It's a six month time frame we should see an increase in that. What we had hoped was that our, our experimental group would actually increase more. Um, what we found was our control group actually decreased, not significantly, but it was somewhat concerning that over six months there was no improvement in our control group's motor ability. Um, we did see um, a significant increase in um, the experimental group when we did uh, regression models, we did find that 38% of the, the difference was due um, to the treatment, which was a pretty large um, weight. The next couple of graphs are just interesting because what we also looked at was in our study we had one third of the preschoolers and our sample was uh, 220 kids. Um, we found that a third of them were overweight or obese, um, but the the normal weight kids improved significantly in overall motor performance and the overweight kids did not, which was very concerning that that, that might be a trend that will continue um, into childhood if we're not intervening and getting those kids to be more active and more competent in their motor skills. The good news was that when we broke it down by, by subtest, we did see that they did improve significantly in locomotor skills. And as I mentioned earlier, we do know that locomotor skills are more predictive of physical activity levels than the other subsets. So we were happy to see that they at least improved in that, but they did um, decrease in stability skills. 
uh, and, and not as much improvement in, in manipulative. We did, consistent with the other literature, find that gender, that girls made more improvements in the object manipulation skills so they can throw better, um, catch better compared to the boys. Younger kids, the three-year-olds, actually had more changes in gross motor performance than the five-year-olds, which could be various um, reasons. Um, the Peabody assessment is meant for from birth to six, and some of the kids on the upper age range may have ceilinged out. Um, also, there's more de development that happens at the younger ages, so there was more room for improvement. And as I illustrated in the graphs earlier, uh, the lower the child's BMI index on the outset of the study, the more changes they did make in uh, gross motor performance compared to the overweight kids. So I get asked often for my colleagues in the department who are more lab-based of what the heck does picky eating have to do with obesity prevention? Um, so getting a child to try a daikon radish is not going to make them thinner, and I know that. Um, but this was used to illustrate there are many behaviors that need to happen to affect dietary intake and likewise physical activity. So what we're doing with these programs is trying to impact um, willingness to try new foods, gross motor performance, with the hope that those are predictive behaviors of dietary intake and physical activity that will in time potentially have an impact on their weight status. What we're really trying to do is establish healthy eating and activity habits in early childhood so those healthy habits carry forward um, into childhood and hopefully into adulthood as well. But it's great to hope, um, but we would love some data to, to put behind that. So we currently have um, a study going on. My team I work with is currently out collecting this data as we speak. Um, it's a longitudinal study, and so what we're doing is following these preschoolers after they've gotten the intervention, and as well as a control group, um, from their last year in pre-K through first, first grade. Um, what, so the kids are getting both the Food Friends and the Mighty Moves programs in pre-K. Our treatment programs are getting what we're calling a booster program in kindergarten and first grade that they do each character has a theme for the month. Um, you can see that these are two banners that are going up in either the cafeteria or the gym or they're in posters. Very simple message, it's a marketing thing. Are you a super taster? Are you a mighty mover? Not necessarily meant to change the behaviors in kindergarten and first grade, but to remind them of how fun it is to try new foods, how fun it is to be active, um, and just get those characters back in front, front of the, the kids with that. And then we will be adding a home component in first grade for things that will be sent home directly to the child um, with the child's name on it that will try to engage parents in doing things with the child at home. Um, and so we're looking at this as, I don't think a year, meaning a year in, in pre-K, is enough to intervene to reverse the upward trend of weight increases. I think we need much longer interventions um, in, if we're going to really want to have an impact on, on childhood obesity and these behaviors. So from a research design perspective, we're following these two cohorts of kids um, in rural communities. Part of the reason we chose rural communities is because there's only one elementary school that these kids feed into. So from a logistical perspective, it makes it a little easier to follow them. But we also recognize that um, rural communities have other um, variables and factors that, are, that we need to look at um, as well. So we are looking broader at what's going on in the community, and we are measuring points at baseline a second time in pre-K after they've had the initial Food Friends Mighty Moves once a year in kindergarten and once a year in first grade with that. We are collecting a ton of data. Unfortunately, I, I was smart enough to put a data management database guy in our grant who is working nonstop with what we're doing. We are doing um, on-site, it takes us about an hour to test a child. And we do it, we split it up, especially in pre-K, where they're doing a tasting panel 
um, asking kids to try nine different foods, a variety of familiar foods, unfamiliar foods, asking them to rank whether or not they find it yummy, just okay, or yucky based on smiley faces. Um, we are adding a tasting booth in the cafeterias in first grade to see if they're willing to just come by and pick up some of those new foods in a real world setting where they're not being asked to try it versus voluntarily trying it. We do plate waste and consumption where we have two indicator foods, jicama and edamame, that they are served, that we're pre-weighing and then post-weighing to look at consumption. Parents are filling out food frequency questionnaires to find out what their normal diet looks like. Obviously, we're doing height, weight, BMI, looking at self-concept and how they view themselves and their interactions with their peers and their family. We have pedometers on all the kids as well as parents who have consented and on a subsample because of the, the size of our sample, we're doing accelerometers on as many kids as we can. And then we have um, our motor assessment tool. Um, parents also receive a packet and I'm shocked that they're filling it all out because working with my colleagues, we all wanted something different. So all of a sudden this packet kept growing and growing. Um, but we're looking at their, their feeding behaviors, their parenting style, their physical activity habits, and then they do a home environment checklist of what foods are present in the home, what, what electronics are present in the, the child's bedroom, as well as what physical activity um, pieces of equipment are available to the home. From the school, we're doing the knapsack assessment, which is a assessment around nutrition and physical activity environment in a child care setting. And then in the school setting, we're looking at that environment as well. And then doing some GIS mapping at the community level to look at accessibility um, to foods, parks, um, and recreation activities. That's been a little bit of a challenge in Colorado because two of our communities are mountain communities. Ton of hiking trails, ton, white water rafting is a big industry in one of the towns. That's technically a recreational outlet is the river, as, as is the hiking trails. So mapping physical activity outlets has been a very interesting conversation on how we're going to do that. Going back to the social ecological model, as I mentioned, it's not a um, unidimensional problem we have. It's a multidimensional. And so what we're trying to do with this grant, you can see all the circles of all the behaviors and the factors that we're exploring. And what we're hoping to do is be able to answer some questions of where do we intervene? What's more, most important? Where can we get the biggest bang for our buck? Um, and what's the length of time we need to do this? You know, like I said, we don't think just one year is, is going to make an impact. How do we sustain these behavior changes? Um, and how do we keep improving on the behavior changes? So we are really interested in the question of if we change food preference, what's the impact on dietary intake and food consumption? And what is the um, relationship with motor performance and physical activity from a longitudinal uh, perspective. We did not in our 18-week Mighty Move intervention um, see a change in physical activity levels. Um, part of it is it probably just wasn't long enough. Um, and we didn't focus on increasing the amount of physical activity beyond that 15 to 20 minutes as well. So there's different types of interventions. With physical activity, we did see a significant difference between weekend um, physical activity and weekday. Um, so weekend was actually significantly higher, which leads me to think, okay, we can do more to intervene in, in the home environment as well. From an ecological perspective, um, what we're trying to think about is how do we, um, what's going on in the community? What's available and affordable for healthy eating uh, food and beverages and access and opportunities for, for physical activity? I think these are all things we need to consider as the environment. You know, we can't go tell parents to bring their kids to a park if the park is not safe or it's not available or it's not age appropriate for young children. From a school perspective, um, certainly food service and meals is one place that we can intervene. Nutrition education with the kids, getting them excited about different fruits, vegetables, foods, and, and whole, teaching them where foods come from. And foods don't come from a can. Um, it's amazing how many kids do not know that carrots grow in the ground. Um, so there's a lot that we can do to teach kids and get them excited. 
providing structured and unstructured physical activity opportunities, I think, is, is very key. And then staff. We, in our study, actually uh, asked the staff to wear pedometers and self-report um, their BMI. And what we did find, we, there were some, some folks that thought, you know what, you're not going to get some of these, these providers and teachers to do what you're asking. Um, we have them sizzling like bacon, popping like toast out of the toaster, melting like butter, you know, doing fun things. And, and a lot of 70% of the teachers were either overweight or obese. Um, what was most interesting is the correlation was the higher the BMI, the more satisfied they were with the program and wanted to continue. And what anecdotally, when I talked to some teachers, I asked them, what's going on here? Not, not based on your weight, but why did you like it? Why do you want to continue it? And the response is, I don't want these kids to end up like me. So I'm going to do anything I can to provide them with opportunities so that they can grow up healthy. So we do, I think we have motivated teachers and staff that we need to provide the training as well as staff wellness. I think that's very critical in, in not just early childhood, but also in K-12 as well. We also, in the literature, need to start differentiating. We can't just say child care, and we can't just say early child care. We need to differentiate on the settings. Um, Head Start and school-based pre-K tend to have limited hours and limited time to incorporate more physical activity, for example, or they're tied to school lunch programs, which can be a challenge. Child care centers, they have the time and they have a little more flexibility in what they're offering from a food perspective, potentially. Money can come into play and money comes into play with, with all of that around food. But child care centers, there are kids who are there for nine hours a day. So there's obviously opportunities to enhance the physical activity. Family child care homes tend to be um, ignored a bit when we're talking about, about some of these interventions. What we're finding, because we've modified our program to, to child care homes, is that in Colorado at least, by the time they become four and five, the kids are either moving into Head Start or they're moving into preschool. And it's really the two and three year olds that um, they, want, they want and need some activities for. And our programs are designed for three to five. So we're having to, to modify um, and bring those down to the two and three year old level to meet the needs of the, the child care homes. The home environment actually has become quite intriguing. Um, we have done about 25 home visits where we looked at the home environment and, and filled out the checklist along with the parent. Um, of our 220 families, 51% of these kids have a TV in their bedroom. Um, and so from a screen time um, behavior, we know that there's, there's some education that can occur there. Um, they're not, there's not access in the home to uh, fruits and vegetables, but there's high access to, to sweets. Um, whole milk is still being offered to, to preschoolers and not um, decreased um, fat milks, as well as there's a limit to whole grains. So there's definitely some room for improvement and changes in accessibility in the home environment, more um, education around the importance of role modeling, the importance of family meal time, and the impact that that can have on both child feeding behaviors as well as on physical activity behaviors. So we are at a very fortunate time in, in this field because we have a first lady who's very passionate about um, childhood obesity. And has really wanted to, to, one of the quotes up here is, we need to give parents the tools um, that they need to help their families be fit and healthy. And I, I do strongly agree. Parents have the best of intentions, um, but we do need to make it easier to make the healthy choice um, and not as difficult as it can be. So what do we do to give parents the tools? I just gave you a sneak peek. Um, when I was pregnant, I think I scared my mother quite a bit because all of a sudden I started getting parenting magazines. Um, I made some comments that I think she shuddered at. Um, but I didn't read them the way she probably intended me to read them. I read them as a, well, this is an interesting research question. So I took a year of these parenting magazines 
And I said, how many times are we seeing nutrition messages? And this is what, I mean, it's all about picky eating and getting your child to love vegetables and here's what you do. And um, what made me cringe was that the people writing it, their qualifications were that they were a mother. They weren't a, a nutrition professional. And so some of the strategies, I just, it was nails on a chalkboard to me. Um, but then my next question was, well, what are the physical activity messages that parents are getting? And that's what I found. There's nothing to do. So that's been an interesting question I've asked is, what, what, do, we, what do parents want to hear about physical activity? So we did some focus groups, and we brought together middle income moms, and they can talk all day about nutrition and picky eating. I can fill a room if you put picky eating on a, a flyer for um, parents at a child care center. You can't get them to show up for physical activity, and it's my kids are already active enough. It's not an issue. We're good. Um, and as a parent of a three-year-old, I'm right there with you. The kid can jump like crazy. Don't tell me he needs to be more active because he's jumping across the living room. It's more natural to them. But as we started talking about it, when we brought up gross motor development, their ears perked up. And they said, well, tell me about that. What do I need to be doing for my child? How do I enhance what they're already doing? Um, so they were open to, to information about motor development. Don't talk about obesity and don't talk about increasing physical activity. So the takeaway from all this is our messages around physical activity to parents is probably not, we're not there yet in what we should be saying. It's definitely not your child should get more physical activity. But it may be engage your child in active play. Encourage your child to explore movement or work with your child on gross motor development. We still need to find the messages around activity that are going to resonate with parents of young children. So where do we need to go? I think in, in the field of obesity prevention with early childhood, we have multiple audiences. We have the kids themselves. We have families and parents. We also have providers and teachers. And um, we have professionals. Um, from a research perspective, there's a lot of folks who are jumping into the early childhood arena coming down from school age, but those of you who work in early childhood know it's a different, it's a different skill set and it's a different understanding of, of what's going on. We have different settings. We have the community, the home, and the actual school or child care setting. Um, again, from a, a research perspective of how are we going to make, how do we know if we're going to make improvements, we don't have the measurement instruments for this age group. If you ever, ever try to interview a three-year-old, it doesn't work. Um, when we were doing Mighty Moves on Activity, cognitively getting them to do some of the, the skills, you know, we tried to do the shuttle run, because at the time we did this, there was not much in the literature, so we took what we could find. We did the the, the set motor assessment, but we did, we put a cone down there and here, and we showed them the shuttle run twice, and we asked them to do it, and when they got down there, some of them would look back and smile at you and say, now what, kind of now what? And you say, oh, run around the cone. They would run around the cone. <laughs> You're like, no, 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 come back. You know, so cognitively, we have some, some work to do on how we're gonna assess on these skills. My <clears throat> I'll ask my son, what did you do at school today? And we go through it, and I say, did you ride an elephant? Uh-huh. Nine out of ten days, he rides an elephant at school. He can't tell me what he ate. I can't rely on him for nutrition information about what he ate during the day. So we do need to have some better um, measurement in instruments. Pester power. I'm a huge believer in pester power. What motivates parents to make changes is about their child. And if the child wants to do something and it's healthy, the parents are going to do it. Um, we use pester power quite a bit. Our parent materials are not directed to the parent. They're directed to the child with messages that, that the parent will see. For example, we give them a placemat at the end of Food Friends with the characters, but on the flip side are all the parent messages because we know the kids want to eat off of the Food Friends placemat. We give the, um, the Mighty Moves musical CD, gets sent home well into the program so that the, the
the kids can show their parents the different activities and movements that they're learning so that the parent then will want to play it because the kid wants to play it. So I think there's ways that we can enhance the behavior changes in the home environment if we have some strategies that are child-centered um, about that. And I do think we need to cha train the next generation of, of early childhood teachers and providers around um, not just learning about nutrition from a science perspective, but what's the application? What's the real world, meaning how do you get a child to try a new food? How do you teach motor development? How do you engage kids in activity on the playground? I think we need to, to look beyond um, just the science in the background and give some more practical ways and address it um, and it be a bigger part of the curriculum as we, as we train. And certainly, once providers are out in the community, how do we get them um, training credits around these topics as well? I think we, lastly to close, is providing opportunities and creating positive environments. Um, in Colorado, we put our kids on skis at a very early age, um, but providing them with, with the, the balls and the jump ropes and the, the, the activities they can do um, and being questioning of other environments in the a Denver supermarket chain, they just introduced these these shopping carts with television screens. And it, and you know I always encourage parents to take their kids to the grocery store so they can learn about food. Maybe don't take them when you're trying to get your grocery shopping done, but use it as a field trip. Um, and I'm a little concerned that we're going to start getting some of the food companies to market on the television screens in the, the supermarket. So we have to be cognizant of the environments, not just in the early childhood centers and schools, but what's going on around kids that are three, four, and five that we need to, to enhance for activity and nutrition opportunities. So with that, I'll open it up and see if there's any questions. You're all tired and want to go home. <laughs> yeah. Have you done any work analyzing um, children's menus in restaurants and fast food at all? Or do you have any insights on that? I've been working with Elena a little bit on, on, on that, um, at, a colleague at Virginia Tech. Um, as a parent, let me tell you how atrocious uh, menus are at restaurants. And um, I think we do need to do some work. And that's where the marketing, not from a traditional marketing perspective, but what's the cost benefit to the restaurant? And in this case, it's not the cost from a social, social perspective, it's dollars of are we gonna get kids to buy it. Um, there's one restaurant that I really enjoy, but they only serve Kraft macaroni and cheese. And the response was, because that's all parents want to buy for their kids. They don't want the real good mac and cheese with real cheese and all that. So it's a supply and demand thing and I think until we get parents, there's still a, a philosophy of it's a treat to go out, but the fact of the matter is today we go out and spend more of our food dollars in restaurants than we did when, when I was growing up for sure. And so it's not a treat, it's the norm. And so how do we have healthy options in restaurants? And I think it's, it's a very big part of where we need to go from an environmental impact. Anyone else? Yeah. The kind of research or question that I had was, you know, we want to expose them to lots of things, let them play. I would say, you know, I have kids too that they did a really good job exploring and kind of not being picky. But then as soon as they get that refined stuff, as soon as they, you know, eat that white bread for the first time, it's so hard to get them to so like what you've introduced. So, I mean, I don't know what my question is, but, you know, how much? Or, or do we have to, you know, is there letting them be open, but yet? <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm probably not the best dietitian in the world. Um, and I say that because I think all foods are good. I think it's quantities that can be bad. Um, and I have surprised people. I think they expect that my kid would never eat cookies and never eat ice cream. And he only eats fruits and vegetables and crazy tofu and weird food. Um, 
the fact of the matter is he loves his treats and I give them to him and, and part of it, and it's harder I will say this it is a lot easier to stand up here and give you these tips and ideas than to actually put them in place when you have a kid who is crying and you just want to, to have a minute of peace and quiet or they haven't eaten because they don't feel good give them a thin mint cookie and the world gets really good for like 10 minutes um, and I've done that and I've, I've sat there and said I'm gonna give him this cookie and I know it's gonna solve my short-term problem but I'm creating creating two weeks of work for myself to to get over that so you know I do think persistence and consistence in parenting a lot of this is parenting when it is having the the conviction and the energy to say you know what it's a treat um, and next time they ask for it when it's not appropriate to say no this this isn't an option I'm also a believer in give a kid a treat every day and they're not going to ask for it every time you know it doesn't become an issue um, give them a cookie for snack time with apple slices or something healthy as well to balance it but if they know they're going to get a cookie once a day they stop asking for it because you've become consistent that it's once a day you're going to get a, a treat um, but there's a lot of processed food out there and it gets more challenging as the kids get older because of peers and because of the other environment that you as, a, as an adult have less control over. So what I mean by that is kids are, are creatures of habit. And if they know they get breakfast, a morning snack, lunch, p.m. snack, dinner, p.m. after dinner, snack, dessert, whatever you want to call it, um, and they're given at relatively the same time of the day. If the child's not hungry at lunch, they at least then know, okay, I'm going to get my snack in a couple hours. They can make the judgment of I'm not that hungry, but I can wait till then. What the adults need to be really cognizant of is not giving in 10 minutes after lunch when the child says, now I'm hungry. And they're saying they're hungry because they want a treat or they want something different. And really being persistent with, no, you had your opportunity. You've got to now wait to lunch. Kids are not going to die by not eating for a few hours. Um, but they're really good at manipulating, and food is the first thing that they can control, and that's why it becomes an issue. Mm -mm. Nope, because then it becomes something that they will do again, and again, it becomes an attention thing. Um, like I said, they're really good at manipulating. Food is the first thing, and they figure it out pretty quickly that they can control it, and it freaks parents out when their kids aren't eating. And kids pick up on that. And um, if you give in, they're gonna they're gonna take you for a ride. Yeah. Yeah. So couple of things there of we really encourage um, parents to have their child be a part of me, of food preparation um, we try to not use the word cooking that much because they're like knives heat they're four and I'm like no 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 I'm not saying take out the steak knives and have them cut up um, but take out the whisk when you're making pancakes and let them stir it they might not actually functionally be able to help but they think they are um, give them the, the plastic knife or a butter knife to cut things up, you know, whatever's age appropriate. But we really try to encourage parents to have their kids as part of, of um, getting, preparing their meals. But also recognize, you know what, maybe the best time isn't dinner time on a Tuesday night because you want to get it done, you got other things to do, versus snack time on a Saturday or Sunday when you have the time to actually um, incorporate that. The other thing that we're very careful about is we don't tell parents which foods they should be introducing to their kids. Um, w what might be a new food to one family is something another family eats. So we're very respectful of you choose what is a new food and also what's in your budget um, because there are foods like Gouda cheese is one of our foods and kids love Gouda cheese. 
but it's expensive. And so, you know, our message is pick a new food that, that or pick a new cheese um, that resonates with you. When we were developing our parent piece, though, um, parents wanted recipes. And we were really, really leery because we didn't want to do that. But we gave them recipes, but it's um, Ollie Orange's bike wheel pizza and put a new vegetable on it. And we don't tell them what vegetable to put on it. We give them suggestions. Um, The 60 minutes of structured is probably the biggest challenge, um, and certainly when we talk to providers in childcare, um, we don't expect that, that they can accomplish that all, but certainly by doing a 15 minute music and movement type activity. Um, but kids at this age, if you've watched them close enough, their activity is very sporadic. And so I have personally taken home some assessment tools that get sent home to parents of preschoolers to assess my son's physical activity level. Not a clue. Could not tell you where on those 60 minutes he, he fits because it's so sporadic with that. Um, but I also have him, if you were at the grocery store with me, you would probably be who is that whack job over there doing that. But to get his attention or to get him kind of focused, I'll be like, all right, let's put our hands on our nose. Or we do structured activity for like two minutes at a time. Um, and it's more because I need to get my credit card out of my wallet to pay or I want to detract him from the candy at the grocery store so I have him do you know something or I'm cooking dinner and I, I have him jump five times and see if he can jump and then he kind of goes off and does his own thing so it's not 60 minutes in big blocks so it gets really hard oh you're <laughs> yeah yeah it adds up to They were, mm -hmm. yes. Also, another question is about the uh, diagrams uh, showed on the slide um, uh, about uh, physical activity pointing to uh, fitness. I wonder if uh, fitness was measured the kids, among kids. We did. So we measured activity through pedometers, the motor, and then we did fitness. And we did a three-minute run to look at cardiovascular again. Um, going into it, there were different settings, and you had options based on the setting of a hallway, a gym, or outdoors. And I would have thought the gym would have been the best, outdoors would have been next, and a hallway would have been the least ideal. The most ideal was the hallway because it corralled them. Um, otherwise, in the gym, they were running, like, you know, again, we're having them run for three minutes in the cone, and they're like, whoa, I got access to the gym, I'm going to run all over. Um, so again, we, we did sit-ups, we did sit and reach, we did the shuttle run, and we did the three-minute. But I question the validity of the results based on their cognitive skills. So that's why we don't talk about the fitness stuff. <laughs> yes, we actually, we have a whole spreadsheet I can't tell you exactly because with it being 18 weeks four times we had 72 and they're broken down but we definitely use that data to um, revisit some that weren't as popular some that the kids just didn't get or that the teachers said this wasn't great kids um, one of my goals in developing the music I was I hope I was being nice to teachers. I thought, okay, you're playing this song for 72 times, four days, four times. It, ha it cannot be so annoying that you want to come to my office and kill me. Um, so I kind of took the philosophy of Disney films with, if you ever watched a Disney film, there's adult humor in that that kids don't get. So we created our, our theme song to have adult humor that kids don't get so that teachers would want to play the theme song and not cringe every time. So the music was widely popular, would probably the most. It was custom. So it was um, 
about how they all have their superpowers and that they do this and they like to jump and run and dance and all that. have a couple more questions. I know some of you need to go. <coughs> if you need extra credit, make sure that you've signed these forms out here.